today, for the world is hollow and I have touched the sky on Trekking in Compliance. Compliance, the final frontier. Tom Fox is the voyager of Trekking Through Compliance. His mission? To explore the original series and seek out and share what it can teach you about compliance. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Trekking Through Compliance, Episode 63, For the World is Hollow and I Have Touched the Sky. In this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, we consider the episode For the World is Hollow and I Have Touched the Sky, which aired on November 8th, 1968, and occurred on Stardate 5476.3. Story synopsis. McCoy calls Kirk to sickbay and informs him that the chief medical officer of the Enterprise, i.e. Dr. McCoy, has contracted an incurable fatal disease called xenopolycythemia and has one year to live. However, McCoy assures Kirk that he will be able to do his job until the end. Suddenly, the Enterprise is attacked by chemically fused missiles and forced forced to destroy them. The Enterprise then diverts and determines the point of origin to be an asteroid 200 kilometers in diameter. The asteroid is actually a nuclear-powered spaceship on a collision course with the planet Darren 5. Spock detects no life forms, so a landing party consisting of Kirk, McCoys, and Spock beam down. While exploring a set of pink cylinders, the landing party is attacked by plaid-clad soldiers. McCoy is knocked out but proves to be none the worse for wear. After informing them that the Oracle advises that the priestess leader, Natira, That they come in peace, the oracle treats them to an electric shock to show what it is like to be their enemies. The inhabitants of the world called Yonata do not know that they are on a spaceship except for one old man who has climbed a mountain when he was young. He gives herbs to the threesome from the Enterprise after their electrical experience, but confides to them things are not as they seem, for the world is hollow and I have touched the sky, he intones. After uttering this Intonation, the oracle punishes the old man with death by means of a subcutaneous instrument of obedience. Spock recognizes Fabrini writing on the oracle chamber and a symbol showing eight planets as in the Fabrini system. The sun of the system, supernova 10,000 years ago, so the inhabitants of Yonata appear to be their descendants. The oracle tells Natira that the people will reach a world of plenty soon enough. This is foretold in a book containing the knowledge of their creators. Kirk and company must convince the inhabitants to alter the ship cor- ship's course before it smashes into Darren 5 and eliminates the three plus billion inhabitants of that planet. In the meantime, the priestess Natira, governing the asteroid slash spaceship, has asked McCoy to become her mate despite the fact that McCoy only has one year to live. McCoy agrees and permits the insertion of the instrument of obedience. However, Spock and Kirk commit sacrilege by breaking into the oracle chamber. Luckily, Natira allows them to return at McCoy's request. Bones finds out about the book and tries to tell Kirk about it by communicator, but is incapacitated by the instrument of obedience. Kirk and Spock beam down, and Spock removes the instrument gizmo of obedience. They tell Natira that her planet Natira, that her planet is actually a spaceship, and she goes to ask the Oracle for the truth. She is punished and nearly killed, at which point McCoy removes her instrument of obedience. When Kirk and Spock try to access the book by pressing the three lower planets on the left side, the Oracle heats the chamber to incandescence. However, Kirk is able to reach the book. He finds instructions on how to access the asteroid's controls by applying pressure to the center of the Oracle as it slides aside. They disable the Oracle and put Yonata back on course. They also discover databanks of the Fabrini containing a great deal of medical knowledge, including the cure for McCoy's disease. McCoy decides to return to the Enterprise, but hopes to meet Natira again when the ship asteroid reaches the new planet. So what's the fun fact for today? Well, the idea of an interstellar arc is indeed an old one, and it was first proposed by the father of American rocketry, Dr. Robert Goddard, back in 1918. 
Olaf Stapleton and Don Wilcox wrote stories about the idea in the 1940s, and most interestingly, Robert Heinlein origin yes, that Robert Heinlein originated the notion that inhabitants might forget they were on a spaceship in the book Orphans of the Sky, a concept later reused by Harlan Ellison in his story Phoenix Without Ashes. Interestingly, this is the only series episode to feature three actors who appeared in the original pilot, The Cage, Leonard Nimoy as Mr. Spock, Majel Bartlett as Nurse Chapel, and John Lomer, the old man at the start, not including the Menagerie Parts 1 and 2, which featured much of the footage from The Cage. Barrett and Lomer played number one, and Theodore Haskins, respectively, in the pilot. The Whether by chance or design, the music that accompanies the appearance of the old man, played by Lomer, is the same music uh, by Alexander Courage that played during some of his lines as Dr. Theodore Haskins in The Cage. In order to give more depth to the planet set, the entrances to the underground civilization were built in two sizes, those in distance were constructed to much smaller, thus creating an illusion of distance. According to the novel The Sorrows of Empire, McCoy's mirror universe counterpart died of the disease in 2269 as the ISS Enterprise neither encountered nor destroyed the Fabrini ship. He was succeeded as chief medical officer in mirror universe counterpart by Dr. Joseph Mungbali who continued to serve to that position until at least 2287. And according to the listings of Star Trek The New Voyages episodes, a sequel to this episode entitled Torment of Destiny was unfinished. So what are today's compliance takeaways? Well, the first one is, as a CCO, how do you manage? Uh, It's uh, really incumbent on you to develop a managing style as management and leadership are different kinds of work. So when managing, uh, you need to work within your sphere of formal authority. When leading, you need to influence and motivate those outside where many crucial stakeholders are critical. Uh, Next up, and I thought this one was uh, probably the most poignant given this particular episode, which is, do your executives have a skin in the compliance game. There's a wide variety of ways you can do this. Uh, They can have clawbacks written into their uh, contracts. They can have, of course, robust board oversight. But putting uh, your executives into the compliance game and having skin into the compliance game, I think, is really something that uh, you should uh, consider so that not only when the regulators come knocking, you can demonstrate it, but also... um, that they really are incentivized to do so. And finally, uh, empathy and compliance. As a compliance professional, do you have empathy? Uh, This episode really drove that message home, I think, obviously with McCoy's illness, but um, do you really, uh, are you able to empathize with those in your organization? I don't believe that uh, empathy is a negative, uh, even while uh, many uh, leaders still uh, exist in command and control type of leadership. But it's something that you need to consider in your uh, leadership style as a chief compliance officer, and it certainly ties in to this episode going forward. I hope you'll join us tomorrow where we take up the well-known and beloved episode of The Tholian Web. If you enjoyed this episode of Trekking Through Compliance, you can help it grow by sharing it with the biggest Trek fan you know. 